Hello, everyone, and welcome to a super, super special edition of She Talks Business. Now, normally when I record She Talks Business, I don't use the video, I just use the audio. But uh, today is a very, very special episode, and therefore I am sharing the video ahead of the podcast release. And for those of you who are watching this video on LinkedIn, you're going to recognize a familiar face if you know me from my previous life. So the first series on She Talks Business is all about strategy. And I thought there was no better person for me to have a conversation with about strategy and leadership than my old boss and my favorite mentor, now colleague, girlfriend, dearest friend, Jackie Fu. So Jackie, thank you for saying yes to doing this. I'm so glad you're here. My pleasure, Lisa. I couldn't think of a better way to spend my Sunday afternoon. It's going to be fun. So, you know, it's funny. I have a memory of you that changed my life. And I don't know if you even know how um, impactful this moment was for me. But there was a time when we were both working at ClearNet before it was acquired by TELUS. And I had to give somebody a, I think it was a final written warning. And you were my new boss and you were like, I'm going to come and sit with you while you do this. And you're sitting beside me and you've got this piece of paper and you've got a red pen. And I'm going through this final written warning with this, you know, manager on my team. And I'm feeling a little bit pressured because my new boss is sitting right beside me. And out of the corner of my eye, all I can see is red red, red, you're writing all over this piece of paper. And in my head, all I could think of is I am so done. I am doing such a bad job. This is going just sideways. Finished the session, the individual left and you said, okay, I've got some feedback for you. And you proceeded to go through that document. This was probably almost 20 years ago, Jackie. And you proceeded to go through that document and give me positive feedback on every single thing that I did right in that session. And I think there was one suggestion you had for how I could improve. That was life-changing for me. And that is the best example of your leadership on a, a really micro level that I can think of because it was completely unexpected. Where did you learn to do that? Well, first of all, let me start off by saying I don't remember that at all. <laughs> and 20 years later, I don't think I've used a red pen and a post-it note. So, um, so first of all, I, I really just think that, you know, we as leaders have responsibility to build self-esteem and to build relationships. And if I'm going to enter into a relationship with you, and I need you to become a a better coach, a better leader, then I need to tell you as much about what you're doing well as what you need to change, improve, uh, refine. And so I have these like really simple models that I use and I sort of do this thing in my head. It's called the one to 10 rule. And I say to myself on a scale of one to 10, how good was that presentation? How good was that coaching session? And if I believe, and I probably did, if I only gave you one piece of feedback that was actually constructive, I probably thought you did a nine out of 10, you know, job on that interaction. And so I'm going to work really hard to find nine good things to repeat the next time you go in. And maybe I would raise the bar on future conversations, but for this first conversation, it sounds like we were just getting to know each other at that time you know, I'm looking at the bigger picture objective, which is I need to build a strong relationship of trust, a strong relationship of partnership. Um, and there was probably some legitimately good things that you did. Don't forget, I don't remember this, <laughs> uh, that I would want you to repeat. But don't we just want that in business in general? Don't we want our people to repeat the things that help them to be successful and not always worry about the things that don't work? Because if we yeah. spend all our time there, then, you know, how are you building confidence and self-esteem in your, in your team member? Yeah, absolutely. I remember it because you were my new boss. 
And anytime you have a new boss, there is a certain level of apprehension because you don't know what to expect. And in that moment, I didn't know what to expect. And what I got was completely different than what I expected. And that has always stuck in my mind as an example of how you lead. Now, I know that's a very, very small, low level example. Right, right. But it is. It is an indicator of your style of bringing out the best in people. And so I want to talk to you today about leadership. And I want to go back to a book that we read together probably two decades ago, The Path of Least Resistance for Leaders by Robert Fritz. And one of the things that he talks about in that book is structural tension and how organizations have to set goals and look at where they're at and then, you know, either lower their standards or rise up. And I want to talk to you about leadership from a a larger organizational perspective, because I believe from my own experience working with you and working inside of corporations that leaders inside of big organizations think about leadership differently than small business owners. And the work that I do today is very much around helping small business owners, but few of those small business owners are thinking about leadership as a lever for driving results. So I really want to speak to the highest level. And I want to speak to that highest level because I want to inspire business owners to really think about how they can move up in terms of their own leadership skills to get better results out of their business. So I want you to talk to me a little bit about strategy and shared vision and the role of a leader. Because I think that sometimes for small business owners, they don't really have clarity. They're not able to crystallize exactly where it is that they want to go. So talk to me about why that's important and how it relates to leadership. Right. Well, I think so many times leaders have their strategy in their head. And I don't think that you can really bring strategy to life unless it is shared. So that would be language that I'd use. And, and clearly we are cut from the same cloth. Um, and in order for there to be shared vision and, and not it being sort of, you know, cliche, shared vision to me is having a very crystal clear picture about what success looks like. And when I think about success, I don't think necessarily about you know, a list of motherhood statements about, you know, we want to be the best customer service organization that sells the most product. And, you know, that's not to me what shared vision is, because you could find that sort of platitude in any organization, they're all going to say the same thing. But to me, shared vision is about really seeing what does success look like when you arrive. So if I go back to when you were running your store, how do you know that your store is successful? So when I'm crystallizing a vision with a direct report, a team member working on a project, I want them to see. And that means all of your senses. How does it visually look? What does it sound like? Um, how do you feel? So if we were talking about success, if we go back to when you used to run a wireless business, how do you know that that is a successful, what's the picture of success? And so you might say to me, well, Jackie, success looks like I have lots of traffic going into my store. And I'd say, okay, and what do you see the customers doing? Well, I see the customers interacting with my staff. I see my staff asking questions. I see them filling up their baskets and then adding on more product. I see customers that are smiling. I see them going to that register. I see them coming back in my next vision. But when I talk about shared vision, it really is bringing your picture to life. Now that's gonna translate into a bunch of statements and mother, but, but as you're bringing your, your organization along, I think strategy is iterative. It just keeps mm -hmm. getting crystallized and crystallized and crystallized. And that's how you stretch your business to become better because the picture becomes more refined every time you go back and talk about that shared vision with your team. So I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, I, I think everyone needs to know what does good look like? What does good feel like? Mm -hmm. What do the metrics of good, you know, um, how are they articulated? Uh, and if you want your organization, and of course I'm, I say organization because I'm used to. Yeah, for businesses. sure. It's the same. It's but I need all, an organization. I agree, but I need every team member to come along. And so the only thing that's going to propel them 
forward to come with you is if they know exactly where they're going. Mm -hmm. Right. And so how do you, as a small business owner, how do you determine what the right vision is? So let's talk a little bit about metrics and models. Because one of the things that I always say to people is what's your business model? And a lot of times they don't know what their business model is. And then when I ask people, you know, what are the metrics that matter the most to you? Or what are your key performance indicators? A lot of times people are focused on the wrong things. They're focused on, you know, dumb stuff, vanity likes, like how many people like my Instagram post and you can't pay your freaking mortgage. You can't hire an employee with Instagram likes. So can you talk to me about metrics and, and how to like, how to figure out what business model you're in, like how in a big organization where you are selling lots of different products and services, there's several models inside of the organization. So how do you get clear on what model to focus on? And what do you think are some of the most important metrics that people look at? Yeah, I think, you know, business, whether it's in a big corporation or a small business, you know, if I really want to dumb it down and make it simple, it's, it's all about, you know, revenue, and growing your revenue and then managing your specs expenses and making sure that when those things add up that you have more revenue than expenses in the very most simple right. terms. However, there are certain things that are what I call levers. And, and those levers drive bigger revenue, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and so all of those levers are about acute focus on making sure you know what the levers of your business are. Are there five key things that drive the biggest profitability, that drive the biggest sales, that drive the biggest you know, engagement? Because engagement of your team members drives those. So you kind of need to know your levers uh, of success. And if you don't spend all your time ruthlessly prioritizing working on those levers, um, you're going to be working on things that are not going to drive. They might be make work busy things. They could be important things but they're not the things that are gonna drive the success of your organization or the success of your department or the success of your small business. Um, and I, I think it is a lot about the discipline of staying on those levers and not trying to do everything, um, especially in a big organization. We have a million projects that we wanna get done, a million initiatives, and it is truly about um, what are the priorities that drive my vision, what are the levers that drive those, you know, revenue, um, top line growth? And what are the mm -hmm. things I have to watch out for that are not causing my expense line to really, really grow? Yeah, that was a really um, important thing that I think I learned from George Cope when he was still at ClearNet and he used to host those all employee meetings and he would talk about these are the three things that are the absolute most important things that we have to do as an organization. And I think in a small business, sometimes what happens is you, you do have um, a busy list instead of a priority list. And when you look at your priorities, your priorities are usually the hardest things to do. They're not the easiest things to do. And so you want to feel like you're accomplishing stuff. So you like start to cross off all the easy stuff, but then you're never really focusing on your priorities. So it's, it's totally, uh, it's really, really important as a leader inside of your organization that you know what those priorities are and that you can convey them to the people that are working with you. Agreed. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you just sort of, for me, separated the difference between strategy and tactic. And I think that what happens is we often uh, like the tactics because it makes us feel like we're getting stuff done. And there may be some quick wins, really. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with working on a tactic, but the tactics have to roll up to the big picture strategy, always going back to the priorities, always going back to, am I working on at the right level? And, you know, you and I used to talk about, you know, high pay activities and, you know, just for your group, the definition of a high payoff activity is something that's worth your rate of pay. And what I mean by that is if you are the business owner or the, you know, the head of a department or a president, um, not all things are worth your rate of pay. It doesn't mean that you can't do the work of the person in your team, 
but it's not a good investment of your time and resources. So, you know, you always have to know your own value. And right. um, I, I think that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you, you, you've worked for a lot of organizations in a lot of different roles. Can you successfully, I might add, can you give me an example of a lever that you chose intentionally to get a result and how it worked for you? Can you think of a lever that you intentionally kind of used in order to really reach a big picture initiative? Hmm, that's a good one. I, I'm going to so many different places in my mind. Um, and I mean, maybe go back to when we when we we first started working together, because I remember, I remember, you know, Jackie Fu, you work for the best division, like corporate stores is the best division in the whole company. And you were like a broken record. But guess what? We became the best performing best place to work inside of that organization. So for me, one of the levers that you were pressing on at that very beginning was the culture formation and belief to really rally people. Like that's an example that I can think of. I'm not sure if you can think of another one that you intentionally used back then. Cause we did some pretty amazing stuff. Yeah, we, we really did. Um, I think first of all, you know, when you're building an organization, I'm trying to go back to that time and actually contextualize for your audience. I know you told me not to do that, but I'm trying. Um, you know, when I think about the experience that we wanted in our stores, a lever for me, um, is a natural place that I go would be learning. Mm -hmm. And the reason that was a really important lever for our organization that we worked at or the organization since is that, you know, it's not about the, the lesson itself. Um, so you're going to send people to sales training and then you're going to send people to leadership training, perhaps, I don't know, small businesses you might, but, but what happens is, um, you have to sort of decide what is the journey that you want your uh, customer to go through. I mean, most businesses I'm assuming have customers and it is about a deliberate customer experience from the time that you, your customer enters your digital space or your retail store or your um, social media journey. And the lever for me would be getting everyone to take the training to drive that journey over and over and over again. And so the lever for me was creating a set of skills that allowed this journey to occur, but not in a programmed robotic kind of way. It, it is, in fact, giving people sort of boundaries to say, this is what we do. This is how we create an experience within our store. So as an example, my current, um, my, in my current world, I have this uh, vision right now, which is about creating customers for life. Mm -hmm. And so then that, that is my shared vision. How do we create customers for life? Not a transaction, but an ongoing relationship where a customer comes back over and over and over again. And one of my levers is to train everybody on the things that drive customers for life. And then to add on the metrics that show that this is a customer for life, whether it's the size of their bas basket, how often they come back, how do we talk to them across that journey? And so in wireless, as an example, the, the area that you shared, it's not just about the event of that sale of that phone. It's about how do we follow up with that individual to make sure that they're using all of the self-serve tools to manage their bills? How do we make sure that they know if they break their phone, that they should be coming back to us and not going to some third party organization where they can be still, how do we make sure that journey over that journey that we're touching that customer, not just because they need a new phone, but because all the way along that two-year relationship that we've checked in with that customer. Mm -hmm. So back to, I'm trying to go to, this was my vision, but the lever that I use to drive that vision is a set of, of training metrics, right. scorecards, 
and sort of events that manage that customer journey. Right. Your team has to have the right skills and competencies to positively affect the journey, which ultimately impact the results. But if you as a leader are not clear on the journey, then you cannot match the skills to the experience to affect the outcome. And so that That to me is the, it's the biggest part of the, the lever is you can't, you can't actually pick a lever if you don't know what you're trying to do. It's like you get in a car. If you don't know what pedal is to step on the gas and which is the brake, well, you're going to have a hard time driving. If nobody's ever explained to you, you know, what you should push to get what outcome you want. And it's the same thing in business. And I think that a lot of small business owners you know, if they're like me, they reached a certain level of management inside of an organization, but they were never, say, the president of that big organization. And so it is. It, there is a skill that is required to develop the big picture strategy. You know, one of the things that I talk to um, Cassie on my team about all the time is how do we teach our team to think, you know, like big picture and tactically? Because I feel like sometimes people get stuck in the tactics without understanding the correlation to the big picture. It's like they can't think spatially. They can't think about all of it as one. And, you know, perhaps that is something that I haven't articulated well as a leader to help them connect the dots. I'm not sure. Right. I think that's a very good point. And I do think that's the job of the leader because everybody has different, you know, different roles in that shared vision. And one of the things I like to do on a monthly basis is I do this thing called the all hands meeting. Mm -hmm. And I bring together all of my team members and they're all doing very, very, very different work. Some people could be working on systems and process. Some people could be working on incentives. Some people could be working on training. They're all different. But one of the reasons why I have this all hands meeting monthly is because the job of the leader is to communicate how each of those folks contribute to the vision. And, and so, you know, I, I know for my team, they re- they're probably just thinking I'm giving them an update because that's sort of how it's positioned. But what I'm actually doing is to talk about the contributions of those folks that are driving, you know, this shared vision. Uh, and it's this constant communication of celebrating contributions and highlighting strengths and ultimately giving them hope that what they do actually matters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in this all hands meeting every uh, month, I'm also calling out, you know, the stars of the contribution and, and they could be people that were never on the radar because in my organization is very large. I'm sure that's not the same as a small business, but how you manifest itself in a small business is catch the little thing and celebrate them. And so that people feel like, whoa, it wasn't this little tactical thing that I did. This is a, you know, a brick in the wall for the entire building or of the vision that I'm trying to accomplish. Right. So, you know, Jackie, my, uh, you have, (laughs) you have profoundly influenced my leadership style. However, your natural tendency, your natural given talent as a leader is to find the good and inspire. I'm like a mechanic. I go in and I see everything that's broken, everything that's wrong. And so if you're the type of person as a leader who always sees what's wrong, how do you train yourself to see what's right? How do you get better at inspiring through looking for the success versus like, it's, it's like you can get stuck in this um, in this never ending cycle of, oh, I got to fix this. And this is wrong. And this is wrong. And this is wrong. And this is wrong. And because you're so focused on trying to fix what's broken, it's, it's like, you're, you're, you have tunnel vision. You can't see all the stuff going on around you. That's good. How do you change that as a leader? Right. So, so first of all, your strengths can also be your weaknesses. So let me start there. And so that's why you and I work well together because I inherently see the world half glass full and I inherently want to see the best in people. That's just who I am. And so I hire people around me because that's my gap um, because I know we have to see the stuff that's broken too. Mm -hmm. So that's not a criticism. It's just a different set of skills. 
And together, those make a perfect symphony. So how do I then become an authentic leader? Because I don't walk in and I don't see all these, you know, things that are broken. I ask the people to see, and, and you know, naively, uh, my leadership style today is very different than even the time that, that we work together. I see many more things wrong today, but how it manifests itself is I believe in public praise and private shame. So I'll call out those critical things that are broken, but I certainly won't do it in a forum. Mm -hmm. I will pull that person to the side and I'll try to do it in a way that protects the self-esteem and make it about the thing that's, you know, could be improved, not the person that can be improved. And I think that's really important. People will always be okay at acknowledging that things could be done differently or things that, you know, these are alternative, you know, ways of looking at the business problem. But I think you have to do both. I don't think you can only see the world through half glass full. Mm -hmm. So to your point about, so how do we help our, um, you know, all of your clients not to go to the path of what's broken all the time? They could use my one to 10 rule to say, how broken is it really? If I step right. back and say on a scale of one to 10, how was that executed? They're going to have to work really hard. If their tendency is to see the stuff that's broken, they're going to have that their area of opportunity is to see the stuff that's really positive. And in the same way that I hire, hire people around me that see the stuff that's broken to, to, to model, they can bring in other people to say, you, this is not my natural tendency. You help me see the good things. So mm -hmm. part of it is maybe they could get someone to share in, you know, perfecting um, and balancing their natural tendencies. And the other thing is to go back to the metrics, because really do the things that are wrong contribute to the success or failure of the business? Who cares? Like if it's something that's not exactly the way that you would do it, but it's not going to impact your bottom line, then don't sweat the small stuff. And I always say right. this thing to my team and anyone who reports to me understands this. I always say when people bring me issues, I go, okay, is it a 10 or is it a two? And they're like, oh, it's a two. I go, okay, then don't worry about it. Only right. focus on the tens. Don't worry about it. And if you keep praising the tens, people repeat the things that you want. You shouldn't spend any time on the things that you don't want, unless the thing that is critically broken is a 10. Then you have right. to have that conversation. Right. I always say, I have a client of mine who's like ridiculously smart. And I always say to her, don't kill a mosquito with a sledgehammer. Right. And so it's exactly. the same kind of the same kind of idea, right? If it's a one or a two out of ten, you don't have to reprioritize your whole day over it. But again, okay. you cannot do that if you don't have clarity on the metrics and if right. you don't have clarity on the experience that you want your customer to have. Because right. what is a two in your business might be a ten in another business, depending on the experience. That they want someone to have. So I'm going to get, I mean, this is an example, but to illustrate, if I go into a retail store and the bathroom isn't pristine, I am not as bothered by it as if I go into a restaurant and the bathroom isn't pristine. Because in a right. restaurant, the food, I am, I am looking at the restroom as an extension of the kitchen. And so as a customer on that journey, it feels like if that's dirty, the kitchen's dirty. Whereas in a retail store, I think I probably would cut them a little bit of slack. At least I know I have in the past. I might not like it, but I don't stop shopping there. But in a restaurant, I might stop eating there. So it's important that you don't prescribe the same rating to every business because it could be different to your customer. But I think that that is key. And even in big business, this is some of our areas of opportunity too, that we have to do a better job of seeing things through the eyes of a customer. Um, You're good. You're uh, yeah. uh, we have to see things through the eyes of the customer. So often we believe our own stories mm -hmm. and we write our own journey and we write our own vision and we don't test and, you know, I think about the, the title of your book, Pilot to Profit, that word pilot is mm -hmm. so critically important because even when we think we get it right, we don't have a hundred percent right until you test with your real customer. Mm -hmm. So even when we launch things, whether we launch training, whether we launch a journey in the store, whether we launch a transaction that's going to change in our retail stores, 
the really the last mile of perfection is before you harden that and plug it in to your day-to-day -day business. I always test, you know, amongst a region, amongst a set of stores. It depends on what the initiative, but testing with your customers is really, really, really important. And that could be testing if your customer is your employee or yeah. testing with the actual customer who, who's buying your product. Yeah. Um, because your example of the bathroom, that's through your lens. Mm -hmm. But maybe if you happen to be retailing, I don't know, something where hygiene is really important, right? Like it's a retail store and it's a spa, right? right? It, it, that then, so the context changes. It, it's right. always not about your example, but every business that you support is completely different. What do your customers think? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and in terms of launching things, at least in, in my world, I have coined a term that I call invitation marketing. And invitation marketing is where you, it's like proof of concept marketing, actually. You go out and you test the concept, you invite people and see what their response is before you make a decision to go all in on it. And what I'm getting from the conversation that we're having right now is you could really use that same approach to what resonates and what offends your buyer in their journey as well. So the bathroom sure. is a perfect example. You could ask your customer if you came into our business and the, the restrooms were not 100% clean. They weren't, you know, filthy, but, you know, they weren't 100% clean. On a scale of one to 10, how important is that to you? And really get a sense of what your buyer thinks. Sure. You know, in my world, okay. in my world, the thing that we treat like a 10 which is probably a 10 for some of our customers, and it's probably a two for other customers, is typos. So because we are posting content for other people, there are some people that really take offense to a typo. But the truth is we all make typos. It's an, and when you are posting a high volume of information, typos are going to happen. Sure. And so it's you know about really understanding I think that's really important to our customers. And I think it's part of our retention strategy, but I've never actually asked my customers that. So it's a really good point that we should inspect what we expect. Absolutely. Right, absolutely. So talk to me a little bit about team because, you know, I have this, um, I, I look at team from two sides. I remember uh, working in the corporate world and I had a budget and I had an FTE count and I could move things around as long as I worked within that budget. But I, and I was responsible for results, but I wasn't spending money out of my own bank account. So sure. in a small business, you, you know, you're, you're managing your own business and you typically small business owners always feel like they have a resource issue. Sometimes I think we have a resourcefulness issue, um, but can you talk to me about the role of team as a leader and you know who to hire, who to fire, how to think through, how to build a team that really helps you to deliver on your strategy? Right. Um, you know, interestingly enough, you might think that a small business is the only um, group that has constraints, right? That you know, I, I, have, I only have so much money and I can only hire so many team members. Well, we have the same issue in a big corporation too. I mean, we also, you know, you're, for those of you who Lucy is the world FTE, that's full-time equivalent. That really means employee. Um, we are given, you know, a, a, a budget of which, of how many team members we can hire, but there are years where we're also told that we need to cut that team. I mean, let's be honest, big corporations have layoffs. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We have had to make tough situations to close retail stores and impact people's lives. So whether or not you're a small business owner or a big business leader, we still feel the same pain that the small business has around, you know, number of people in the team and the choices that we have to make. Different scale, but similar. But I think your question was more around, you know, how do you build the right team? And what is the value of the team? And for me personally, uh, I know what I'm really good at and I am acutely aware of my areas of opportunity. And we just use some examples right here in this podcast. I hire for my guests. I never hire for my strengths because I feel like I'll do my best in those areas, but I hire you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. I think everything is possible 
in 50% of the time. Right? <laughs> I'm a big picture thinker. I and so I that. actually, <laughs> if you actually look at the people who uh, are on my direct report team, they are completely opposite to me. They are much more, um, I don't know, detailed, um, certainly less emotive. Um, they look for the critical gaps. They tell me and manage my expectations because I tell them their job is to tell me no, but why not? And so I'll continue to jar with them, but I want their input. I do not want a yes team. I want a team that saves me from myself. So I'm going to, as the visionary in the organization, I'm going to, you know, create the art of the possible, but then we have to land the plane. And so when I think about building my team around me, it's the people that are going to help me land that plane. Because if you have a vision that never lands, that's not a business either. Okay. And so then uh, that would be the first thing is uh, hire for your gaps to create a complete uh, team. And then it's about keeping that team. So I talk a lot, and this is you talk about George Cope. He's a great in, in inspiration to me. And he always talks about when you find your A team, keep them, work with them, groom them. They're going to go off. A players go off and do other things. Um, but your A team is really important. And you always have to ask yourself, do I have an A team? Mm -hmm. And if you don't have mm -hmm. your A team, you have to have the courage as a leader and especially as a business owner to make the tough call. Because I used to say, we don't have room or time, or if you, if you really worry about money, you can't afford to have a C player on your team. So put on, as you like to say, your big girl pants or your big boy <laughs> pants and make the tough call because you have only so many slots they better be your A players. That is the job of leadership. Make the tough calls. Do you think that I like terminating people or letting people mm -hmm. go? But you know what? I have to, I'm a people leader, but I have to make those tough calls because I'm accountable for the success of my organization and the success of my team. And the reality is your team members also know when the member on the team is a C player. Yeah. And maybe you can stretch your B to an A, but if you think you can make your C or D player, player an A, that's ego. And when I was young, I used to believe, because I thought everything was possible, that I could convert that C and D player to an A player. But that cost me money. Mm -hmm. And that cost me time. And that cost me results. And ultimately, can't make it happen. You got to hire A players. And you have to have A players all around in the right areas of responsibility. Because also, if you have A players but you have a gap somewhere in a core specialty or a function that you need within your group, that's no, not, not good either. So you need A team players in all areas of your business. Yeah, absolutely. And as a leader, it's hard. It's hard to, it's hard to let people go when you have relationships with them and you do believe that they are capable. But what I have learned Jackie over the years is you know if we go back and look at you know are you willing and are you able a players are willing and able b players are able and they're willing sometimes c players tend to be willing but not able and so you know it's it's really important that you're able to make those decisions and you're right it's 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 painful and i know uh, we both believe that, you know, empathy and caring about people is an important part of being a leader too, but sometimes you got to make some really tough decisions. I had to make a tough decision on my team um, a few weeks ago with respect to something that I considered to be a breach of trust from a very, very long-term person. And it was really hard and really upsetting. But to your point, you have an entire team watching you when you don't take action on those things. Correct. Absolutely. Um, and you're accountable for the success of the whole team, not just the one individual. Yeah. I think the thing that's different when you own your own business versus you work for a corporation or, you know, or you're an employee inside of that small business is when you're the, when, when you're the owner of the business, you're not accountable to anybody else. 
And so I often joke that the reason people hire me as a business coach or advisor is because they need somebody to be accountable to, and I will hold them accountable. I will hold their feet to the fire and therefore they will perform better because they don't want to let me down. And so I think that regardless of whether you own your own business or you work in an organization, it's always good to have that check and balance that, that, that extra person that you do feel somewhat accountable to for your own performance, because you talked about the stories we tell ourselves. Well, we can tell ourselves stories around rationalization and procrastination all day long if we want as business owners. So I want to talk about um, one more thing before we wrap up today. I want to talk about uh, values or guiding principles in the role as leader. What are some of the attributes or, or values or beliefs or characteristics that you think are most important? Because I know that my experience over the last 15 years working with small business owners is the topic of leadership does not come up very often. The topic of marketing does, the topic of lead generation does, the topic of how do I understand my numbers do. Like there's a whole bunch of other things that come before leadership. Whereas if we were really looking at the hierarchy, leadership sits at the top. Leadership is what influences all of those other things. But a lot of small business owners don't really think of themselves as leaders. They think of themselves as entrepreneurs that are running a business and they're responsible for all these other things. So if you were to you know, guide us on why we need to think of ourselves as leaders and what those attributes, values, whatever characteristics are that are most important, what would you say they are and why? A big question. Um, I think, yeah, it's a big question for sure. Um, I think as a starting point, leaders need to give hope um, and um, a cause for their people to rally around. And so people will come to work every day if they know that they're going somewhere, that they're part of something great. And, and so I, I think as a starting point, um, you know, you kind of have to make sure that your team knows that there's something in it for them, that their contribution matters and that it contributes to the, the, the big game. And so then it goes back to then what are the attributes and values that are required for people to align their, um, their beliefs, their things that are important to them with the things that are important to your business. And, and I think the way that you do that is, and I'm gonna steal this because I, I love Simon Sinek, but Simon Sinek always says, you know, great leaders have two important ingredients or attributes. One is, perspective and the second one is empathy and i think that's really true that you know uh, if you have perspective you're able to see your vision and see all the ingredients that go into that vision but then also see the perspective of your employee of your customer really come down and empathize um, and are able to walk a mile in their shoes, then you're able to really connect those dots because you're mm -hmm. saying, you know, here's my understanding of the situation. Here's my understanding of where we are in the marketplace. Here's my, my business perspective. But I empathize with the employee um, and the team member and the customer in terms of what their situation is to make that um, perspective come to life. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, then I'm just going to go back to my own view, and that is, um, I believe that an important value is trust, mm -hmm. because to me, trust is everything. If your team members trust you, trust your vision, they will follow you. They won't question, why are we doing what we're doing? But in order for you to... Um, have trust, you have to gain trust. You can't ask for trust. And so the way that you gain trust from your team is by ensuring that their perspectives matter, that you understand their situations, um, and that you are consistent, transparent, they can count on you, you say what you do, 
or you do what you say is what I meant to say. Um, and that it's not an event. And when I think about, you know, does my organization trust me? I believe the answer is yes. You know, we do these employee surveys. Trust and leadership is one of the most important ingredients because trust is belief and belief drives behavior. If you don't believe something and your boss asks you to do something, you'll do the task. But if you really believe in the vision, you really believe in what your leader is telling you, you'll take on your own set of tactics to drive that activity um, because the belief is stronger than the tactic itself. Mm. It's really good. Like I, I, you know, Jackie, we've known each other for a long time and I always, I always walk away from every conversation we have together, whether it's over a nice dinner and a bottle of wine or, you know, a quick phone conversation on the ride into work. I always walk away feeling like I've learned something. And I think that that is also something that's really important for business owners is to have somebody in their court that they can learn from, that can stretch their thinking, that can inspire them to play a bigger role. Because as I listen to you talk about this, I think about my own business. And, you know, I left the corporate world in 2006. So this November, I will have been running my own business independently for 15 years. That's a long time. And yet I look at my vision and the impact that I want to make. And I don't think I have been clear with my own team because I feel like my vision is, um, I don't know how to describe it. It feels, I don't know, it feels odd to me. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to articulate it here because I think you can help me frame it differently. So, you know, when I was a kid growing up, my mom had a job and I was a sick kid. I had Crohn's disease. And one time I was really, really sick and I was hemorrhaging from my bowel. I spent a week at ICU. And when my mom went to her boss and said that she needed to leave work early to take me to the hospital, he wouldn't let her leave. And he told her, you've got problems and I have problems here and you need to stay. And that created um, a change in me that I would, A, never have a boss that would not let me do what I needed to do in my life. And B, I wanted to really help other business owners to understand how to run a business and make enough money that they had freedom to do what they needed to do in times like that. And so I am so passionate about helping business owners be financially successful because I believe the impact of that financial success for small businesses is so great. You know, when a small business is financially successful, they can hire people. When they hire people, they're providing for those families and the ripple effect is huge. But it just feels so, I don't know, it feels like a not a very important thing when I say I want to help businesses make money because I want them to be able to have a better life and to be able to provide, you know, a good life for other families. It feels shallow. That's how it feels to me because it's related to money. I'm not sure that's so shallow because there is just a reality around, you know, money is freedom. Let's just really be honest with ourselves. If you have more money, you have more options. And uh, I think that wealth creates wealth. And when you create wealth for others, you don't know the ripple effect mm -hmm. that it's having. Like think about every new immigrant story of success. Um, it started off by survival. How right. do I survive? And then, oh, okay, I'm now surviving. I'm going to help other people survive. And those turn into beautiful businesses. And really, if you think of the foundation of our amazing country, you know, I certainly know that I have a lot more in my life than my parents had in theirs. And I'm sure you, you too. And I think about all of the, um, people that have grown, you know, grown. And I, and you're, you're talking about it from a small business perspective. I talk about it creating wealth within a corporation, within a company. I think about how many vice presidents 
um, you know, that I have been lucky enough to work with that got promoted. You know, I see them go up level or directors or managers. Uh, and there is nothing more rewarding than seeing them grow and create wealth for themselves. That's okay. I don't think we should be apologetic about that. I think that wealth creates wealth, growth creates growth. Um, and that cliche pay it forward thing is okay. And I think that back to my point about leadership being about perspective and empathy, one of the reasons why you are such a great um, you know, champion of the small business owner is that you have both. You have perspective, you've walked a mile in those shoes. And so you, you use their speak which is they need to be successful. They need to make their business successful, but you have empathy because you know what it's like. You know what it's like to think about every dollar that I have to um, worry about spending um, every mistake that maybe you've made in your past that you don't want your client to make. Uh, so I, I don't know that that's such a, you're almost sort of, um, and you shouldn't be self-deprecating about that vision. It, mm -hmm. In its simplicity is so much beauty. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as, as, as you say that, I'm thinking about, um, the, the building of wealth inside of a business is passed through so many other ways. And it has such a big ripple effect, similar to leadership. You know, right. when I asked you to do this, you made a comment to me about, oh, you know, you have all these people, you know, you're a great leader, all these people follow you. And I'm like, yeah, but your influence has influenced me, which has influenced others. And, um, you know, I also know that your influence uh, came from your dad. And there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of fooisms that, you know, <laughs> came, came from directly from him and a lot of, uh, you know, Sunday dinners that I benefited from his wisdom, even though I wasn't at those dinners. So I would be remiss if I didn't honor him in this, you know, relay of leadership as well. Yes, thank you, Lisa, for sure. Biggest mentor um, ever. And to this day, you know, uh, most of my management, my leadership, my care and concern for people, uh, my genuine interest in seeing people grow, grow and flourish, uh, comes from my father and that's what he wanted for his family when he came to this amazing country um, and because of that uh, I also feel the ripple effect of, of his great leadership for sure yeah all right well Jackie Fu any final thoughts before we wrap this up it's been so good to do this with you. <laughs> um, no, I listen, Lisa. I love seeing your success and your people's and your client's success. Um, there's nothing that makes me happier. The, the greatest gift of leadership is seeing people grow and benefit. Um, and, you know, I recently have received a ton of emails um, from people that I've helped in stores, you know, there's some things going on in my life that cause this sort of ripple effect of, of emails. Anyways, I, I'll try not to go there, but, um, and what I realize is there's no paycheck or um, title or promotion or anything that is more valuable than knowing that you made a difference in someone's life. And that because of that difference, they are now, you know, in a better place than before that interaction with you. And isn't that the definition of leadership? Helping people to achieve what they couldn't or wouldn't without your contribution or presence. Like that to me is, is the greatest thing. And hopefully we, you and I have created um, and helped to uh, grow this leadership bank uh, wherever it is. Absolutely. Uh, as we wrap up, I am reminded of something that I read yesterday. I'm rereading the book called The One Thing. And he talks about the one thing in the book and how it is in everything. And he talks about there is one person in your life that means the most to you. There is one person who has had the biggest impact on your growth and career. And if I were to say the one person who's impacted my leadership, it would be you. So thank you for that, Jackie. Thank you. Wow. What an honor that is. Um, and it really um, almost makes me emotional, but thank you, Lisa. That's a, that's a, that's a great, a great gift for sure. Um, You're welcome. Thank you for thank sharing you. everything you did with us today.
It is absolutely my pleasure. I hope you have me back sometimes. This was so fun. Yes, we will do it again for sure. Thanks, everybody. Hey, if you worked with Jackie or I at TELUS and you got all the way to the end, I want to see your comments. Make sure you leave a comment. Bye. Thanks, everyone.